Hi, everyone. The Business Ethics Leadership Alliance has questions and we have answers. I'm your host, Bill Coffin, and this is another Bella Asks episode of the Ethicast. One of the best benefits of being a member of the Business Ethics Leadership Alliance, or BELLA, is that if you have any questions at all about ethics and compliance, you can submit them to BELLA's concierge service, which will connect you with one of our internal experts who will provide an answer and or direct you to a helpful resource for more information. Sometimes these requests are specific to a particular company's needs, but most of them speak to broad challenges facing BELLA members in general, and by extension, the wider ethics and compliance profession. That's why we're using this show to thematically respond to high-level questions from the Bella community. Joining us once again to give those responses is Bella Chair Erica Salmon-Byrne. Erica, thanks for returning to the show. As always, it's great to see you. Well, Bill, thank you so much for having me back. Um, I am delighted to keep coming back and answering these questions for as long as our community has them. So this episode is part of a series we're doing on third parties. So the mm -hmm. question we have is, what is the first thing I should focus on when measuring and assessing third-party risk? Yep, absolutely. And Bill, before I dive into that question, I want to talk for a quick second about why we're doing this as a three-part series. So uh, as long-term members of the Business Ethics Leadership Alliance know, we've been collecting data on third-party diligence practices for many years now. But this year in our ethics quotient, which is, of course, the survey that we use to underpin all of our benchmarking and to do the world's most ethical companies process, we actually built on the third party uh, uh, section of the questions uh, to really dive more into this growing risk area, both from a company perspective, right? So, you know, obviously third parties present companies with a lot of risk, but there's also been a lot of regulatory focus in this area. You know, think, think of things like the German supply chain, you know, modern slavery uh, regulations. Think about some of the things we're seeing um, come out of some other regulatory regimes, both in, in Europe and then uh, here in North America. There's, there's a growing understanding of the interconnectedness of the supply chain and the ways in which good companies can lift up the practices of those that they partner with. So that's part of the reason why I really wanted to do this one as a three-parter, because otherwise we would have been doing an hour and a half long Ethicast. <laughs> Not the worst thing in the world, though. Not the worst, Not thing, the worst in the thing in the world, but we might have <laughs> lost our audience along the way. So to your question, which is sort of that first stage, what I would call the pre-contract um, early identification stage of a supply chain relationship. And to be clear, when I say supply chain relationship, I mean any part of the supply chain. And particularly for a lot of the organizations out there listening to this, you may very well be on both ends of this process. You may be a supplier to somebody who is asking you these questions, and then you may also have suppliers of whom you are asking these questions. So really thinking through what are the indications that a particular supplier is presenting me with risk? And what are the questions that I can get a, my arms around to make sure that I understand what that risk profile looks like? So um, we just recently launched our World's Most Ethical Companies uh, honoree group for 2024. So I'm going to give a sneak peek into some data in today's Ethicast uh, on what we're seeing WME honorees uh, do as, as it pertains to due diligence. So not surprisingly, they all do it. Um, and they look at a variety of things, right? So the average honoree is looking at between five and seven different characteristics to decide how risky a third party is. So they might be, for example, looking and I apologize, I'm gonna look over my screen here because I'm actually reading live data. Um, they might be looking at things like financial stability, right? How financially stable is this particular supplier? Is this somebody that I can work with for a long time? They might be looking at um, who did I learn about this supplier from, right? Is this somebody who's being referred to me by a trusted uh, partner of mine already? Or is this somebody that, that a government official, for example, is suggesting that I might want to work with? That's going to give me a different sense of how risky this particular third party might be and accordingly what level of due diligence I might want to potentially do on this third party. 98% um, of honorees are looking at geography. Where is this third party located? Where might I be working with them? 90% of them are looking at the industry the third party is in. So some industries are going to be riskier than others. 88% um, of them are going to be looking at the value of the contract involved. So they'll have dollar thresholds, right? And then 87% um, of them ask questions uh, of their internal business partners around the criticality of this particular supplier to a project, right? Is this 
a irreplaceable supplier, in which case you're going to do more diligence than you might otherwise do because you really want to make sure you're selecting the right partner. So those are just a couple of things to think about. It all, you know, Bill, you and I talk about risk on almost all every one of these ethicasts, right? Mm -hmm. It all goes back to risk. How risky is this third party? What mm -hmm. questions can I ask my people about them to get a sense of that risk? And then that's going to tell me how much deeper I need to dive to make sure I'm really comfortable using this particular supplier. Well, Erica, I was not expecting a sneak peek at this year's World of Ethical Companies data. So I'm just tickled over that. Thank you so much for such a wonderful answer. And as always, thank you so much for sharing your insight and your expertise with the Bella community on these questions. I know they very much appreciate it based on the response we've gotten to the series so far, and they're always looking for more. So thank you for your time. Oh, absolutely, Bill. My pleasure. And anybody out there who hasn't watched my colleague Craig Moss on the use of blockchain and supply chain uh, management, another Ethicast that Bill uh, recorded recently, Make sure you go back in the feed, find that one, and, and take a listen there, too. I'm Bill Coffin, and this has been a special Bella Asks episode of The Ethicast. For more episodes, please visit the Ethisphere YouTube channel at youtube.com slash ethisphere. And if this is your first time enjoying the show, please make sure to like and subscribe either on YouTube or on... Well, I'm going to do it all over again. <clears throat> You've got me in a rare day, Eric. I'm sorry. I'm Bill Coffin, and this has been a special Bella Asks episode of The Ethicast. For more episodes, please visit the Ethisphere YouTube channel at youtube.com slash ethisphere. And if this is your first time enjoying the show, please make sure to like and subscribe either on YouTube or on our podcasting platforms at Apple, Spotify, Google, and Amazon Music. To learn more about Bella, please visit bella.ethisphere.com to request guest access to the Bella Member Resource Hub and to speak with the Bella Engagement Director. Thanks for joining us. And until next time, remember, strong ethics is good business. Ethics doesn't just happen. You need to put in the time. So make sure to register for the 15th Annual Global Ethics Summit, a live and virtual event in Atlanta, Georgia, from April 22nd through the 24th. Save $200 by using the code ETHICAST at registration. To learn more, visit attendges.com.